guys, um, welcome to my kitchen and a new lecture on um, kind of more of a specific topic but I think that it's something that probably deserves more explanation which is Alexander Hamilton from economic policy. Um, and actually I'll be honest as a teacher economic policy is always something that I've kind of struggled with a little bit. Um, so it might be good for both of us if we kind of take ourselves through um, Hamilton's economic policies and kind of looking at where he's coming from and um, really the role of the Federalist Party and his belief system. But if we start from the beginning, we, we can see um, kind of where Hamilton is coming from when we look at some of the writings of the Federalist Papers. So, for example, when uh, Hamilton writes, um, all communities divide themselves into the few um, and the many. Uh, the first, well-born. Uh, the second, the masses, turbulent and changing. Uh, therefore, give to the first a permanent share in government so they may check the unsteadiness of the other. Uh, I, I know that I messed that quote up a little bit, but, but the concept of that quote is uh, kind of the faction idea, that uh, there's so many factions in America, and, and the largest of those factions maybe being the poor, that to trust them with the well-being of the, uh, of the country might not be a good idea. Really, it's really kind of a, uh, a shot at kind of majoritarian government or direct democracy. So actually what Hamilton's arguing for, the Federalist perspective, I think, is really to find a way to kind of make sure that the, the engine of the, of the government is, is controlled by, in his, his eyes, uh, the few, uh, the well-born. You can, you can hear that kind of elitist ring in there. Um, so Hamilton, as a Federalist, uh, believes in government. I think uh, sometimes we, 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 we get things backwards today because many times we'll hear um, rich people today say that they want less government and they, they don't want to pay taxes or... Um, some type of laissez-faire uh, philosophy, but but Hamilton back then they want the government to be active because they see the government really as being the engine of the economy, or at least providing opportunity for manufacturers and uh, for those that own private property to keep that private property and really to protect their interests and, and as they see is the greater interest as well. Um, so I think that's number one is seeing that the Federalist Party is is, is really the party of, of of the Northeast. It's the party of maybe the manufacturer, of, of the well-born, of, of the rich, of the landowners, of uh, maybe those people that had a vested interest in uh, making sure that uh, private property was secure and we didn't have some type of redistribution of wealth program or um, something like that. And I think they saw the federal government as maybe, um, like I said before, the engine, uh, you know, their vehicle to be able to, to accomplish that. Um, much like Locke talks about natural rights, he talks about really protection of private property. Um, and maybe even, if you, if you will go way back, the AP idea, I guess, would be kind of Thomas Hobbes, in this kind of, I always mess the, the book up, Le, 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 Levithan, or Levithan, um, kind of this idea that, you know, um, people people are, are bad and they're, they're, they're radical or they're self-serving, and that government's job is to be the stable hand, to be to be maybe, um, you know, the end justifies the means kind of concept. But I don't want to go on too far about that. Let's kind of get this down and break it down really nice and easily. This is basically maybe three or four things we can look at, specific policies that Hamilton um, advocated as Secretary of the Treasury under Washington. Um, I think number one is you can, you can kind of see where he's coming from, from the first sales tax that is a federal sales tax that's passed, which is um, oddly enough on whiskey. Um, and I think that this, this might be a stretch, but, but if you just look at maybe who drinks whiskey, um, as opposed to many, you know, maybe some of the other um, liquors that they could have taxed, like rum, I think that you find that for the most part it's, it's the masses, it's, it's the poor, it's the farmer. And actually this first sales tax leads to the Whiskey Rebellion. Um, I get my years wrong, I think 1796, um, Western Pennsylvania, where there's basically like a Shays kind of rebellion against the federal, the new federal tax and this new federal constitution on what they see as their livelihood. Um, and I really think that this gives Hamilton and, and Washington, the Federalists, the opportunity to really do what they couldn't do in Shays' Rebellion, which is using the federal government's force, um, aka the Supremacy Clause, in order to prove the point that um, once and for all, that in this relationship, this new relationship of federalism, that the federal government has the upper hand, that the federal government is the one that makes the decisions and, and I've done this analogy before, I find some people maybe don't like it, but the children in the states um, need to be able to listen to their daddy. Um, 
That's why sometimes you'll hear me call the supremacy clause the who's your daddy clause, because I really think it gets across that, that point. Um, number two, so one is kind of sales tax, the Whiskey Rebellion, supremacy. Um, I think two shows even, even a more direct link between his elite base, manufacturers, landowners, and economic policy, which is tariffs. Um, basically, a tariff is a tax on an import, and we're going to find that northern states and federalists, um, Hamilton followers, Hamilton himself, are going to want to be able to pass this tax in order to protect manufacturers. Um, in class, you'll hear me kind of joke around and we do kind of the underwear example. Um, you know, if you have American underwear and French underwear, that we would love everyone to buy American underwear, but if the French underwear is cheaper, um, ooh la la, we're, we're going to um, buy the French underwear. So one way to help Fruit of the Loom and I'm not talking about the consumer, I'm not talking about you, the underwear wearer, but rather the operator of the factory that makes underwear, um, is that we tax the French underwear. Therefore, the you know, 50 cents tax is going to make the difference where now you go into the store and you buy American underwear. Um, and this is good for manufacturers. It's going to increase their profit margin. It's going to you know, allow them to expand. It's, it's, it's in Hamilton eyes, a good idea. Um, now, the anti-Fed, or the Democratic Republican idea is going to be that this hurts consumers, especially farmers in the South. This is really going to be one of the catalysts for the Civil War. Um, I don't want to get my years wrong, but I want to say 1828. Uh, Andrew Jackson, who was actually a Southerner, um, was ready to go to war over tariffs when Southern states tried to nullify tariff acts in the 1820s um, because they felt that it was bad economic policy for those states, for the kids in those states, um, as opposed to what the national government saw as being best for the nation, the economic well-being of the nation, I guess, a.k.a. the Northeast manufacturers. Um, I think the third and the, the fourth example that I'd like to go over kind of go together, but it's the idea of the National Bank. Of course we know that Secretary Treasurer um, uh, Hamilton is the father of the National Bank. Um, and I'm watching my clock run down in YouTube time, so I guess we're at 7.20, so I don't want to rush. But the idea of the National Bank really is that this is the engine. This is the government control over the engine, over the money supply, over interest rates, over lending, over borrowing, um, really that is going to enable the government to facilitate manufacturers, to facilitate that class of people where we can make sure that there isn't maybe redistribution of wealth. That might be a stretch. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. Um, but definitely interest rates and loaning and making sure that the government has a hand in making sure that manufacturers are well taken care of. Another idea related to the national bank is the national debt. Um, and again, I think that we're going to see that uh, maybe catalysts of civil war, or at least ideas that the southern states don't dig kind of the federalist perspective. Um, and that would be the national debt. Um, if we just go back like 15 years and we look at the Revolutionary War and where most of the fighting occurred, we find that most of the fighting occurred in the north. Now, of course, under the Articles of Confederation, um, which had a weak set of federalistic principles, so states kind of were on their own. Um, states in the North incurred lots and lots of debt. Um, they had to borrow money in order to defend their states. So now under this new constitution, we really see the North burdened um, with a lot of debt, kind of, you know, hunkering down their budgets. Again, Northern states, manufacturing base, um, a lot of rich people. You know, I don't want to make this class warfare, but definitely the elite. Southern states don't have that debt. So what the National Bank is going to do is incur the federal debt. Um, so now, basically, if you think of, you know, I don't want to get too proppy here uh, as I look around, but I have, I have this. If this represents the National Bank and I'm kind of a northern state and I have kind of hunker down with the national debt, kind of walking around like hunchback, what Hamilton wants to do is to take the little birdie off my back. You know, if I could, I guess I'd rip it in half and put a little piece on me and put a little piece on the South. And suddenly, you know, I, you know, I get helped and the South doesn't get helped, you know, so the national debt. And I'm watching my clock here, I don't have long. Two court cases, I think, also illustrate what Hamilton's talking about. One is McCulloch versus Maryland. This is the National Bank case, where when the National Bank set up shop in Maryland, and Maryland tried to tax the National Bank, Hamilton get a favorable decision when the court says, hey, you know, supremacy clause. You're not allowed states to tax the father of the federal government. And number two, it allows for, you know, a loose interpretation of the Constitution with the Elastic Clause. 
saying the bank is necessary, really going beyond the words into kind of a new territory. We're going to stop there. I, I, I could do interstate commerce, but I'm not. The father.